Welcome. Welcome to this countdown event of the Generation Equality Forum hosted by the Black Feminist Fund on putting Black feminists at the center. My name is Hakima Abbas, and together with Tanisha McHarris and Amina Doherty, we're the co-founders of the Black Feminist Fund. At the Black Feminist Fund, we're committed to leaderful practice. So Tanisha, Amina, and myself will be your hosts for today. Black feminisms are truly global and multiple. To reflect that and allow us to contribute, we have interpretation in French, English, Portuguese, and Spanish, as well as closed captioning in English. Please choose the language that you want to listen to by clicking on the globe at the bottom of your screen. So the purpose of the Black Feminist Fund is to significantly increase resources available to Black feminist movements globally. The BFF, our fund, is an unprecedented funding mechanism connecting Black women donors to grassroots Black feminist organizations, groups, and collectives. We model for the philanthropic sector. I'll say that one more time. We're going to model for the philanthropic sector and beyond the kind of solidarity funding Black women and all of our diversities deserve. So as Black feminists, we want to ground today's discussion in the people who have come before us and the many who have made it possible for us to be here today. We celebrate, honor, and appreciate you. What we want to do here today during this countdown event is to set the tone and deeply center Black feminists who are experts and leaders in the multiple fields of the Generation Equality Forum process. So sit back, relax, and let us take you on this journey of how Black feminists are the antidote to a world in multiple crises. So I will be kicking us off today, starting the conversation. Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nguka needs no introduction in this forum as she is the reason we are all here at the Generation Equality Forum. She is the Executive Director of UN Women and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. We are honored to have her here with us today. Also with me is Erica Malunguino. In 2018, Erica became the first transgender woman to be nominally elected as the state legislator in Brazil with over 55,000 votes in the state of Sao Paulo. Erica is also known for being the founder of an urban quilombo named Apareia Luisa, a territory in Sao Paulo's downtown for black arts, culture, and politics. Welcome. I'm so grateful to have you both here today. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Pumzile. So here we are at the Generation Equality Forum, 26 years after Beijing, and with the SDGs committing to leaving no one behind. Yet some people still ask us, why are we talking about Black women, girls, and non-binary people? Are Black feminist issues global issues? Do you think you could speak, uh, you could address that for us? Well, thank you so much and welcome to Generation Equality. I can't believe we are here at last. It's been long coming and uh, we thank all of you who have uh, registered and please continue registering. There's still some slots open. The question you are asking me is very interesting for marking uh, the, the 26 years now of uh, the adoption of the Beijing Declaration, because guess what? In Beijing, non-binary women did not get a fair share. The women who were in Beijing with their delegation from their country, the governments uh, from different uh, countries were a, a challenge. Many women did not want to rock the boat. They were worried that they have come this far. If they put this issue, uh, it could just turn everything upside down. So women who were non-binary, were actually almost pushed back and asked to hold on. And they have been holding on for the last 26 years. Black women, their issues were not also on the table in Beijing. 
Uh, and you, as you can imagine, black women were predominantly the most vocal women in uh, Beijing, but not about being black. They were vocal about all kinds of issues and there's lots of issues, but not about these issues. Now we're done leaving people outside. What we are doing now in generation equality is finally rounding it up and making sure that everybody is in. And I want to thank the Black Feminist Fund for the work that you have done and for putting this issue on the agenda and making sure that uh, women from both ends will be able to be, to be heard. UN Women is with you, will be with you because this is our issue too. It impacts on us quite drastically. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pumzile. Thank you for reminding us about how the Generation Equality Forum is a space that brings everyone along, is a space that is inclusive of all people. Um, and it makes me think actually back to the words of, of Kimberly Crenshaw, another Black woman who also brought to the table the idea of intersectionality. So um, lovely to see this work continue and, and for that idea to keep growing. Erica, I'm gonna to turn to you now. Um, you came into office after the murder of uh, Marianne Franco. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Bom dia a todas. É, muito obrigada pelo convite é, do Fórum Feminista Negro. É, eu Eu tenho certeza né, que esse convite e que a inclusão de mulheres trans não viria de, outros, de outro lugar, senão do feminismo negro. É, a terra que nos pariu, a nossa mãe terra, ela não escolhe as filhas e os filhos que tem, ela simplesmente os tem. Então, é, a partir do feminismo negro, que tenho certeza que a revolução que transcende o gênero, e inclusive a raça e a classe, virá. Então, quero agradecer de prontamente estar presente nesse espaço revolucionário. Quero dizer também que, é, como primeira parlamentar, primeira deputada é, trans eleita no Brasil, foi em 2018 que eu fui eleita, é, eu entendo o tamanho da denúncia que nós temos que fazer em relação à violência política de gênero e à violência política em relação às pessoas transgênero e às mulheres transgênero. O fato de eu ter sido eleita, para mim, é uma denúncia Né? além da celebração e do momento importante, é, é uma denúncia. E essa denúncia ela está calcada assim, numa história muito longa que se começa aqui com o estupro de mulheres indígenas, de mulheres negras africanas escravizadas e que permanece até hoje. Né? No Brasil, um, é, é, uma mulher é estuprada a cada oito minutos, segundo o Anuário de Segurança Pública. E essa violência que começa né, é, no processo de colonização, ela se estende a ponto de matar Marielle Franco, uma vereadora lésbica eleita no Rio de Janeiro, brutalmente assassinada, a ponto de matar recentemente, de, de tocar fogo numa travesti viva, aconteceu semana passada na cidade de Recife, no Nordeste Brasileiro, uma mulher trans, foi ateada a fogo. Então, nós vivemos uma crise, né? uma crise humanitária em relação ao corpo das mulheres, né? em relação à violência de gênero que transcende a política institucional. Na política institucional, eu posso denunciar inúmeras violências de silenciamento, de toques indevidos no corpo, mas essa violência política ela transcende a institucionalidade, ela está calcada na cultura brasileira de modo, como eu falei anteriormente, uma mulher estuprada a cada 11 minutos. Então, nós temos sim a missão, e sem dúvida, né, é, num país de maioria de mulheres, de maioria de mulheres negras, isso atinge diretamente nossos corpos, nossas existências, como se nós não precisássemos lutar por uma, uma, uma busca de ascensão econômica, social, educacional, ainda ter que lidar com as violências constantes. Eu queria denunciar essa barbárie acontecida nesse país e dizer sim 
que temos avanços, conquistas importantes, outras parlamentares trans acabaram de ser eleitas nos municípios, é, Brasil afora, nós temos outras mulheres negras de gênero também eleitas, mas os nossos corpos estão em, em constante negociação. É urgente que as defensoras e defensores de direitos humanos olhem com... com com profundidade para os problemas é, da violência política no Brasil. É importante olhar neste contexto agora de um governo extremamente reacionário e conservador, que tem pautas absolutamente racistas, misóginas, mas não só nesse momento. É olhar agora para proteger nossos corpos, mas também pensar no marco civilizatório, num projeto de futuro na qual a, permanen a entrada, a permanência e a expansão das mulheres negras em espaços de poder seja uma regra e não um risco, né? uma regra para construir uma sociedade diferente e não um risco para os nossos corpos e para a nossa comunidade. Um beijo, muito obrigada, e estou aqui à disposição de todas. Thank you so much, Erika. Obrigada. Thank you. I'll pass it over to you, Hakima. Black women in power becomes a rule and not an exception. I think that's so important as a message from Erica. Thank you so much. I'd like to turn now to my comrades Chidi and Mariama. Chidi King is the director of the Equality Department at the International Trade Union Confederation, the umbrella organization for trade union national centers worldwide. And Mariama Sonko, organizes in associations and movements defending local knowledge and peasant practices in agriculture. Her own agricultural production um, is what sustains her entire family. Um, and she is the president of a movement, We Are the Solution, which is present in seven countries of West Africa. So Chidi, I'd like to turn to you. Um, we just heard Erica talking about the power of Black women and the potential of Black women in government. The Generation Equality Forum is a multi-stakeholder process. There's been a lot of debate about the role of the private sector there. Can I ask you what needs to happen for the private sector to support Black feminist agendas globally? Hello, hi. Um... Thank you, Hakima. Greetings, everyone. Well, what an honor to follow from Zile and Erica, <laughs> I have to say. And I think, in fact, um, Erica just uh, answered um, quite a bit of the question that you've put to me. Um, maybe let me start by acknowledging that, um, you know, since the um, murder of um, George Floyd and too many others, um, indeed, um, and the resurgence, of course, of the Black Lives Matter movement, we have seen the private sector um, starting to talk about the issue of racism, you know, particularly um, in the world of work. The question then is whether this is more than just talk, whether you know, this is more than you know, paying a superficial lip service um, to this question, whether it's cosmetic, whether it's a PR exercise, or whether there's something more revolutionary that can come out of this and can be sustained. Um, I would say that for the, for the time being, we haven't really seen that from the private sector. And the acknowledgement that needs to come from the private sector is the, you know, is the acknowledgement of the very model on which you know, um, global capitalism at the moment is based. And that's a model of you know, super exploitation, I would say, um, of the working class, of land, of our natural resources, it's the alienation of people from their own culture, um, whether it's you know, indigenous peoples, the alienation of them um, from their land. It's, it, it's acknowledging that history of global capitalism that is so steeped in slavery, in settler colonialism, imperialism, and neoliberalism. And lest we think that all of that is something of the past, we just need to look at the model of supply chains and how those function you know, across the world and look again at you know, um, where people are working in these supply chains and who is working where within the supply chains. And again, you see the roots of this model of global capitalism you know, being repeated um, through the supply chains. You see where um, you know, black and brown bodies are within these supply chains. 
when you look at where um, they operate, whether it's in Asia, in the Americas, particularly in Latin America, in Africa, again, when you look at where um, women in particular um, sit in terms of jobs within these global supply chains, you see that you know, there's not that much that has changed in terms of the actual model. And I think in terms of embracing a black feminist agenda, the private sector really needs to come to grips with this and really needs to intentionally, um, you know, revolutionize um, this model, um, move away from this super exploitation, acknowledge that it's a model as well that uses violence um, to, to a large extent, again, you know, to enable the super exploitation, to silence um, workers very often um, within, um, you know, these working environments. Um, and as Erica said, when we're looking at, you know, where women sit, we need to look at us in all of our diversity and again, acknowledge that, um, you know, the, the different ways in which, um, you know, oppression operates, exclusion operates, alienation, marginalization operates, um, depends on acknowledging, again, all of those identities. We know that, um, and, you know, Erica said it much better than I, I certainly could have, that when we look at, for instance, um, you know, the levels of violence against um, transgender um, women, when we look at the fact that very often, um, you know, in our workplaces, in our working environments, when we talk about gender for a start, let's start there, when we talk about gender and improving the situation for women, very often we're looking at this sort of homogeneous, um, you know, form of women, rather than acknowledging that, you know, there are all these multiple identities. I think, um, I mean, I mentioned um, Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, in her theory of uh, and practice of intersectionality. So again, the private sector needs to understand what this means and what this means in terms of observation of human rights, responsibility for human rights, in terms of truly embracing, um, you know, the, the, the idea that um, if um, the private sector wants to go further than just embrace, let's say, some sort of um, CPR, some sort of, you know, um, what's the, the term I'm looking, some sort of PR exercise, public relations exercise, um, that it really needs to do this deep examination and it really needs to, um, look beyond this model of maximum profit, of denying um, responsibility for workers within supply chains, for example, and saying, well, you know, um, we are not responsible because we don't know what's happening in our supply chains, that they need to do the due diligence, that they need to stop moving, you know, communities off their land, again, for the sake of that maximum profit, that they need to acknowledge that we are in a climate emergency. And the way that business is done at the moment is ultimately going to harm all of us if there's not this revolutionary change. I think I may have used up my six minutes there, but um, I think you know the final thing I would say there, um, you know, talking to organizations like the Black Feminist Fund is not a bad place, again, for the private sector to start. And of course, with my trade union hat, hat again, talking to organized and non-organized workers, I would say is absolutely essential for the private sector to to change and move forward on this. So um, thanks again, and I'll stop there for now. Thank you so much, Chidi. That's so important, the deep and intentional reckoning and moving away from the super exploitation of black women workers and our labor. Um, and you mentioned the climate emergency. So I'd like to here turn to Mariama. Your campaign and your network boldly claims we are the solution. Can you tell us what African rural women are the solution to and how these alternatives can save our planet. Uh, merci beaucoup, Akima. Vous m'entendez? Oui. Allô, vous m'entendez? Yes. C'est bon, OK. Donc, euh, c'est Madame Maria Massonko, présidente du Mouvement panafricain, nous sommes la solution. Euh, je suis très ravie d'être invitée à ce panel. Je suis une femme rurale et présidente de ce mouvement. Nous, nous pensons que les femmes rurales sont la solution, car c'est elles qui pratiquent l'agriculture vivrière dans les exploitations familiales africaines. Et dans cette exploitation, elles ont un souci du bien-être de leur famille. 
de l'entretien de leur famille, essentiellement à la survie non seulement des familles, mais aussi des communautés, des nations, de la terre-mère et de l'environnement. Leurs activités de production ont une telle importance pour l'autosuffisance alimentaire qu'elles font que euh, aujourd'hui on dit que l'agriculture la, la, africaine est une agriculture féminine. Non seulement la production vivrière est aujourd'hui partiellement ou totalement avec les femmes, mais certaines de leurs activités sont de plus en plus orientées vers les productions de légumes, fruits destinés euh, du marché mondial. Donc, euh, on pense qu'aujourd'hui, les mots que nous avons euh, de vers nous par rapport à la mauvaise alimentation, aujourd'hui, la raison est que la pratique agroécologique que les femmes pratiquaient dans l'agriculture vivrière est une solution et qu'elles sont la solution pour une bonne, euh, un bien-être familial, un bien-être de la nation, mais aussi un bien-être de notre environnement parce que notre environnement est malade. Et aujourd'hui, grâce à cette euh, intervention avec le mouvement Nous sommes la solution, nous avons mis en place des alternatives, par exemple la production d'un bouillon naturel appelé Soupac. Et ce bouillon naturel, c'est à partir d'un constat au niveau du Sénégal où euh, les familles utilisent euh, les bouillons industriels qui gangrènent beaucoup de maladies aujourd'hui, qui ne disent pas leur mot. Et aujourd'hui, on pense qu'avec les produits naturels que nos mamans utilisaient pour assaisonner nos plats, on peut avoir la santé, mais on a la protection de l'environnement, on a la promotion de nos consom de, du consommé local, mais on a la création de l'emploi, on a la préservation de notre environnement par la promotion de la, la protection des arbres en voie de disparition. Par exemple, le néré, avec lequel on fait le sumbala, quelque part, on dit Sumbala ou le Netetou chez nous, qu'on utilise vraiment pour euh, assaisonner nos plats. Aujourd'hui, par rapport à l'agriculture, nous avons eu des alternatives en, en mettant en place des centres de formation ou de partage d'expériences sur le savoir-faire. Un des objectifs de Nous sommes la solution, c'est vraiment la promotion du savoir et savoir-faire. Le constat est que ce savoir-faire est dans les mains des femmes rurales et nous devons le partager avec les autres pour vraiment instaurer la souveraineté alimentaire en Afrique. Et elle ne peut pas se faire sans les femmes rurales. C'est elle la solution. Et nous pensons qu'aujourd'hui, euh, la, la réalité est en train de, euh, de, 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 de mieux visionner la vision des femmes, les actions des femmes qui méritent d'être soutenues et qui méritent d'être promus dans leur vision de développer leur localité, de mettre en œuvre leurs activités pour une souveraineté semencière, une souveraineté alimentaire en Afrique. Ces braves femmes qui travaillent inlassablement au profit de l'humanité. Aujourd'hui, beaucoup de firmes sont en train de, de s'enrichir sur le travail qui a été fait de ces femmes-là durant des années et des années elles sont les gardiennes des semences en Afrique. C'est elles qui ont gardé ces semences. Elles les ont testées. Elles les ont multipliées. Elles les ont mis au service de l'humanité. Donc, je pense que ces femmes-là, elles sont la solution pour une souveraineté alimentaire en Afrique. Mais aussi, elles méritent d'être promues. Elles méritent d'être soutenues. Elles méritent d'être euh, encouragées dans ce qu'elles sont en train de faire pour une Afrique une nouvelle Afrique, mais une Afrique verte, une Afrique souveraine, une Afrique qui va sortir de cette colonisation qui ne dit pas son mot, parce que quand on nous serons autonomes en semence, nous pensons que nous serons autonomes et nous serons souverains dans nos actions, dans notre alimentation pour une, euh, une vie durable ou une souveraineté africaine. Donc, euh, euh, si j'ai un peu de temps pour développer de plus, nous avons vraiment, euh, on est en train de faire la promotion du consommé local en mettant en place euh, des concours culinaires. Et là encore, c'est euh, l'expertise des femmes que nous voulons mettre en œuvre en, leur, en, en, en les poussant à démontrer 
qu'elles peuvent faire mieux avec nos produits locaux, avec nos plats, sans qu'il y ait de, 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 de problèmes de santé, mais que nous allons pousser le développement de notre cher continent vraiment pour un développement meilleur et harmonieux. Et aujourd'hui, par rapport à ces mais, vraiment, euh, nous avons vu que les femmes sont créatives, elles sont vraiment initiatives dans leurs actions. Donc, elles méritent d'être soutenues et poussées. Cette femme africaine qui a ses connaissances depuis très longtemps pour un développement harmonieux, je pense qu'elle mérite d'être euh, elle, elle mérite d'être renforcée, elle mérite d'être soutenue, elle mérite d'être vraiment encouragée dans les actions de développement aujourd'hui. Euh, on est en train de montrer vraiment euh, ce que les femmes rurales savent faire par rapport au développement rural dans tous les domaines. Nous ne sommes pas dans l'agriculture seulement, on est dans la transformation, on est dans la commercialisation. Aujourd'hui, euh, on est en train de promouvoir le riz euh, local qui qui va nous amener vers l'étuvage du riz. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, on a eu à travailler avec la recherche pour voir quels sont les nutriments que retiennent, que regorgent nos, nos semences paysannes. Et ce que nous avons trouvé, c'est des choses qui sont vraiment extraordinaires, qu'on ne peut pas croire qu'on peut en trouver dans nos aliments. Donc, je pense qu'il est temps que les gens essayent de partager sur les nutriments que regorgent nos semences paysannes nos semences locales qui, qui ont un lien, non pas de, de l'aliment, mais qui nous lie à notre identité africaine, qui nous lie avec notre tradition, qui nous lie avec notre culture. Nous devons vraiment promouvoir ces semences qui sont un patrimoine communautaire, mais qui sont dans les mains des femmes et qui ont été gardées depuis des années jusqu'à présent. Et si on prend on, euh, les firmes sortir ces semences. Les femmes, les femmes n'auront plus le rôle. Je pense qu'il euh, est nécessaire aussi sur cette, cette question de semences qui valorise la femme, surtout la femme africaine, plus précisément la femme rurale. Donc, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons un lien entre nos semences et nos traditions et nos cultures qui nécessitent d'être promues. C'est un, un aliment d'alimentation, de, de, mais elle a d'autres rôles qu'elle joue dans, dans ce que nous sommes, dans ce que nous nous reconnaissons. Et je pense que ça mérite vraiment un soutien, ça mérite une réflexion par rapport à ce, tout ce que nous faisons, parce que nous sommes Africains, on se reconnaît dans ça. Donc, euh, c'est un cri de cœur d'une femme rurale, d'une femme à la base, qui souhaite vraiment que euh, ces semences qui lui ont été léguées depuis des ancêtres soient sa propriété. Et elle est toujours là pour le bien-être de sa communauté, le bien-être de sa famille, le bien-être de ses nations. Et je pense qu'aujourd'hui, euh, nous avons eu l'occasion d'avoir des femmes leaders, des femmes qui sont à la tête des organisations au niveau international et qui nous entendent et qui peuvent porter plus haut le cri de nos cœurs aujourd'hui par rapport à notre vie africaine, par rapport à nos cultures, par rapport à nos semences que nous tenons tant parce que nous sommes des femmes rurales et nous pensons qu'on ne peut pas vivre sans les femmes, sans les semences. Une paysanne qui n'a pas de semences, c'est une paysanne qui est pauvre, c'est une paysanne qui est déshonorée. Et je pense que euh, nous devons aussi porter notre par rapport à la valorisation des semences paysannes. Je vous remercie. Mm. Mariam, thank you so much. Uh, there's so much that you said that is on my heart. Um, thank you for talking about Black feminists and Black women, Black rural women being already the solutions, having the solutions, practicing the solutions, and the clarity um, that everyone, they all deserve the resources, the support, the encouragement, the investment. Thank you for that. Uh, I don't know how everyone else is feeling, but I'm feeling so full with the brilliance here. So excuse me as I'm like trying to get my words together. Um, Black women are powerful. We are all powerful. 
And I'm about to introduce another powerful, uh, powerful woman. I have the pleasure to introduce Nicolette Naylor. Nicolette is the International Director for uh, Gender, Racial, and Ethnic uh, Justice at the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation is one of the largest privately owned foundations in the world. So Nicolette, we just heard from Mariam, Mariama how Black feminist movements are the solution to a world facing multiple crises, multiple crises. As you know, the Black Feminist Fund has started groundbreaking research looking at where is the money for Black feminist movements. And as a part of that work, we have collaborated with the Human Rights Funding Network. So in our early anal analysis from that work, y'all, um, we have revealed that Black feminist movements have received somewhere between 0.1 and 0.35% of annual grant making monies from foundations. I'm gonna say that one more time. Early analysis from the, that work has revealed that Black feminist movements receive somewhere between 0.1% and 0.35% five to 0.35% of annual grant making money from foundation. Nicolette, what is happening here? Why are black feminist movements not getting the funding that they deserve and what can we do about it? So Nicolette. Thank you, Tanisha and everyone at the Black Feminist Fund and on this panel with me today. Let me start with the, with the context of what's happening here before I get to the why and the what we can do. Um, maybe referring to what uh, Pumzile reminded us, when we celebrate the achievements since Beijing 26 years ago, we should remember that that slogan, women's rights or human rights, was a powerful moment for women's rights. But at the same time, we need to recognize that Black women's experiences were rendered invisible or marginalized within that slogan without any real engagement with the differences between white women's experience of gender inequality and the intersection of race, class, and sexual orientation with gender discrimination for Black, Indigenous, women of color, trans women, gender non-conforming individuals. So what is happening here? We shouldn't underestimate the power of white supremacy and racism when it comes to funding and the way funders operate. And white supremacy is intersecting with misogyny, patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, ageism, and then add in the bias in terms of English. And you just have all these barriers stacked against black women. Thanks to black women's activism around the world, we are having a conversation about the intersection of race and gender. But my fear is that as we enter the deepest recession in our lifetimes because of COVID, this is going to result in cuts for funding of the feminist movement and black feminists are going to be the hardest hit. So why is it that black feminists are not getting the funding they need? Here, I want to make a distinction between funding work, studies, advocacy, litigation, research about black women, where black women are the subjects, but the actual work is being done by white women, because this is very different to funding black women, black feminist organizing directly. For example, in my part of the world, in South Africa, funders have often funded work related to black women's experiences of violence or gender discrimination. But the money for the work, the advocacy and the research is often going to other organizations led by white women. And the work has often been extractive of black women's experiences and stories without giving black women the agency, the power or the credit that we deserve. So we actually have to overcome decades of not funding knowledge generation and leadership of black women. And then there's also the issue of trust when it comes to funding black women's organizations. Within philanthropy and the funding community, and I'm speaking as a funder, including the funding community that I am part of. I see that we would much rather do work at the diversity, equity, and inclusion level, where we're making investments in making white organizations more brown, rather than funding Black-led organizations that have been in existence for decades. It's easier to stick with the groups we all already fund and work towards hiring some black women within those structures, rather than search for and invest in black women's organizations 
or new Black-led organizations such as the Black Feminist Fund. I also think that within philanthropy, we need to overcome the fear of funding the political and the feminist. We're often uncomfortable to fund work about Black power and the more political or feminist work that is geared towards addressing structural barriers to gender inequality. And then I think paternalism in funding. There's a perpetuation of the white savior complex when it comes to funding black women, where we're all trying to save the poor black girl in Africa from female genital mutilation or violence. And we need to introspect on that as we talk about decolonizing philanthropy. And we need to disrupt this notion that when it does come to funding black feminists, it should be small grants, projectizing black women's projects, um, or funding them through other intermediaries where the scale and the percentage of the funds received by black women in the global South is much smaller than when you compare that to international NGOs in the global North. So what can we do? We have to talk about this, acknowledge that this racism exists within philanthropy, within social justice philanthropy, and we must hold up a philanthropic mirror to our practices in terms of who we fund, who we trust, and how we relate to and fund Black feminist movements. Funders are slowly beginning to recognize this, and many funders, like the private sector that Chidi spoke about, are embarking on self-reflection and elements of what I call navel gazing around how to get better. We must push much harder so that these exercises are not just about talking. We need to stop talking and start funding black feminist organizations like we want them to win. We must also continue to advocate for more funding and we must showcase the evidence that holistic intersectional approaches is what works if we want to address gender inequality. That's where the impact lies. And we must undertake the kind of research that the Black Feminist Fund is doing now. And we must track and audit the funding community, including bilaterals, private, public foundations, to really understand how much money is going to feminist organizations. And we must make sure that it's disaggregated data so we're getting the data for dis indigenous women, black and brown women, trans women, gender non-conforming organizations that are working on feminist power building in the global South. And as we listen to the commitments that are being made at Generation Equality, we should listen carefully for how much is being said about black women and for black women. And as you and women embarks on the next phase of Generation Equality and as civil society, thinks about accountability, let's all track the data and advocate more clearly for doubling or tripling the amount of funding for Black feminist organizing. Thank you. Nicolette, thank you for your leadership and for your words. Fund Black feminists like we want them to win. Thank you. I'm going to pass it to my sister, Amina. Thank you so much, Tanisha. Thank you, Nicolette. Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about some of the challenges that we face, even as the Black Feminist Fund, working to mobilize resources for this work, for all of the issues that my sisters Mariama and Erica and Kumzile have brought to the table. And even as we work to mobilize $100 million as the Black Feminist Fund, um, you know, we still get questions, you know, how will you get there? I think that this is a space where we bring to the table all of the activism, all of the work that we need to see mobilized and acknowledge the fact that even that amount is not enough. We need to do more of mobilizing to support this work. Um, so I've been doing the very fun work of monitoring the social media, monitoring the question and answers. And one of the questions that has come up several times, um, I'm going to ask it to all of our speakers here today is, what is one action you would recommend from governments, private sector, and civil society engaged in the Generation Equality Forum that would contribute to advancing Black feminist agendas? I know some of you have spoken to that already, um, but we would love, the audience would love to hear a little bit more about that from you. 
So I'm going to start us off uh, with Pumdile and then pass it on to our wonderful Erica. Thank you. Uh, my biggest wish is that women are in the leadership of all these funds we are talking about so that it is the women who are making decisions, black women in particular, making decisions on behalf of the women who would be the ones benefiting from the funds. Black women must not be waiting for someone else to save them. One of them, some of us must be in there to make decisions for our lots. Thank you. Thank you, Pumdile. Erica, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, so you have uh, seen. É, quero agradecer, foram muito boas todas as falas. E assim, em relação a um processo futuro, de construção de futuro, de um projeto de futuro, obviamente, né, a nossa palavra de ordem se chama reparação, reparação histórica, porque nós não estamos pedindo favor, nem estamos pedindo, enfim, nós não estamos pedindo favor, nem estamos esperando o mínimo, nós esperamos o que é nosso, que nos é por direito, temos ajudado e construímos todo esse mundo, esse globo foi construído por nós, das nossas costas, a partir da nossa força de trabalho, e no entanto nós não fomos ressarcidas e indignadas de acordo a que nós é, colocamos para construir esse mundo. Então, a palavra reparação é uma questão de ordem, de distribuição de renda e trabalho, de renda e trabalho. E estar em todos os lugares, eu tenho, eu tenho muitas questões sobre estar em todos os lugares, porque eu acho que alguns lugares não deveriam existir. Eu acho que nós temos que estar em lugares que, estrategicamente, sejam bons e nutritivos para a nossa comunidade. Porque tem lugares que são estratégica que só alimenta uh, façon, esse capitalismo doente que acaba nos prejudicando. Então, que a gente possa ocupar lugares de forma estratégica lá, e que esses lugares sejam propositivos e benéficos à nossa comunidade. Então, estar na política, eu acho que é um lugar possível, necessário, importante, é, é, trabalhos com comunidades rurais, potencializando mulheres pretas, enfim, trazendo essa tecnologia, né, uma tecnologia, essa tecnologia ancestral que, na verdade, resolve as grandes questões da modernidade, né? é entender é, o respeito à terra, ao cultivo, né? a questão da segurança alimentar, enfim, que é uma das coisas que, é um dos venenos que também nos mata, né? Esse, é dentro da, dessa estrutura capitalista. Então, junto com as comunidades rurais, as mulheres, é, enfim, que estão é, em setores de exclusão, como as mulheres transgênero, porque nós somos não só aliadas, mas estamos sustentadas pela luta do feminismo negro, mas também nós retroalimentamos esse feminismo negro. É assim, é dentro de um processo de uma é, distopia hierárquica, nós mulheres negras e mulheres trans negras e mulheres com deficiência negras, estamos na base da base dessa pirâmide, né? E essa base não nos coloca apenas como seres passivas e recebendo toda a estrutura sobre nossas costas, mas nos deixou também muito mais hábeis, muito mais capazes e, acima de tudo, mais sensíveis para desconstruir essas violências estruturais. Então, assim, tem uma responsabilidade, sim, que é do governo, do poder privado, em reparar, né? em devolver, aquilo que nos é devido e a nossa responsabilidade enquanto comunidade é fortalecer essa rede de solidariedade, de afeto, entender que não é o milhão de poucos, os milhões de poucos que sustenta esse mundo, são os poucos reais, poucos dólares de muitos, muitas de nós, que realmente faz essa gira girar. Então, se a gente estiver bem organizada, bem orientada e construir sustentabilidade nos nossos projetos, nas nossas, né, enfim, a gente não vai precisar ficar à mercê 
dessas oscilações cambiais e dessa economia branca que diz o que é inflação, que diz que é alta do dólar, que diz que é alta do sei o quê, e o nosso povo está sempre à disposição dessas oscilações. Um exemplo disso é a pandemia no Brasil, aliás, em vários lugares do mundo. Quem foi as mais prejudicadas, quem mais morreu, quem teve menos acesso à vacina, quem mais empobreceu, o Brasil voltou ao mapa da fome, o povo preto, periférico, indígena, quilombolas. Então, assim, o nosso corpo está sempre sob sobre risco, sempre sob risco. Então, a gente é, tem uma responsabilidade que é do governo, tem uma responsabilidade que são dos poderes de reparar isso e tem a nossa tarefa de casa, que é quando, quando, quando nós conquistarmos qualquer coisa que seja, que a gente tenhamos, que nós tenhamos a capacidade de fazer isso se tornar retroalimentável autossustentável, né? com tecnologias ancestrais, como bem já foi dita aqui, é, pelas nossas ancestrais africanas, indígenas, é, e vivas améfricas. Acho que é isso, quando a mulher negra se propõe a ser a revolução, não é uma utopia, nem é um imaginário militante. Nós realmente, efetivamente, nós temos as chaves para desatar o nó das violências estruturais. É sobre a gente, mas é para a emancipação coletiva. Né? Isso não é uma, uma fantasia, isso é, isso é consciência negra, isso é compreender como todos esses tijolos foram construídos literalmente sobre nossas cabeças e a gente viu tudo isso acontecer e criamos, sim, tecnologias de sobrevivência, de permanência, mas ainda de vanguarda. Então, o passado, o presente e o futuro está em nós. Então, se o mundo vira as costas para isso, está dando as costas para o próprio futuro da humanidade. É isso. Axé. Thank you so much, Erica. Axé. I am so full. I am so full. You covered so much. Um, and I'm especially glad that we're recording this conversation because I have so much to come back to in what you shared there. Um, but I'd love to, to ask the same question of you, Nicolette, and maybe to add on one of the questions that have come up from the audience, which is, in addition to an action we can do at the Generation Equality Forum, how can we hold large institutional funders accountable to Black women and to get them to fund more Black-led organizations? That's a question from Brittany in the chat. Nicolette, over to you. Thanks, thanks Brittany and thanks, thanks Amina. I do think that we need better accountability mechanisms within philanthropy. We often talk about civil society being accountable and accounting for how funding is received and what's been done with money, but we don't have dual accountability where philanthropy is also accountable to the sector. And how is a philanthropy being accountable to black feminists? So how do you hold accountable beyond solidarity statements, for example? We saw a flooding of solidarity statements coming from the sector, um, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Well, hashtag show me the money, where's the money for black movements? And so how do we go back to all the solidarity statements and say, so tell us in your funding, can we do an, a racial justice audit? How many, if you're spending $500 million per annum in large foundations, how much is going to black led organizations? How much is going to feminist movements, women's rights organizations? What's your baseline? Where do you want to be five years from now? That's more useful to us beyond your solidarity statement. Um, and what are your goals and targets for doing that? And what are your goals and targets internally? Because we also have to transform the way philanthropy looks. We have to occupy those spaces, occupy those tables, lead within that space, because that's how we can shift the thinking as well. So you need transformation within philanthropy. And to Kunzile's point around leadership, you want to see Black women leading in philanthropy. And then you also want to see that accountability at the end of the day. And I think civil society, the time is right for the feminist movement to start to rethink what accountability looks like. Um, towards the feminist movement. Let's start asking for dual accountability um, from the philanthropy sector uh, so that we can start having much more in-depth conversations that's about trust and partnership building. Um, and my advice also to philanthropy would be 
we need to talk less and listen more. We need to be listening to what women want, how they want to be funded, and we need to stop creating dependence because that's a colonial model. It's a savior model. We're not building and sustaining organizations in terms of endowments, in terms of longer term support. We're creating a dependence cycle, which is not useful for black feminists or for the kind of work that we want to see. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Chidi next and Mariama to speak a little bit to an action um, that could come out of this Generation Equality Forum as we put Black feminists right in the center. Hi, uh, thanks again, Amina. I think everything that's just been said before me is, is what I would say. Um, you know, um, the, the points that Nicolette made about the way that philanthropic organizations approach, um, you know, Black-led and particularly um, Black women-led organizations um, is key. We need to see a sea change there. The points that Fumzile made about leadership, again, and you know, hats off to the Black Feminist Fund for demonstrating that leadership. This is crucial. We need to make sure that out of this Generation Equality Forum, we don't revert to what happened in 1995, where voices were silenced, where voices were excluded, that right at the center, of the Generation Equality Forum is exactly what um, you know, the Black Feminist Fund is seeking to do, is to make sure that you know, Black women's um, voices, um, you know, trans women's voices, Indigenous women's voices, women in all our myriad diversities, that our voices are not just heard, are not just um, you know, carrying influence, but are carrying power that, you know, that we are actually shaping. Um, what comes out of the Generation Equality Forum. And that actually requires a big change in mindset because the same structures that, um, you know, operated um, to keep these voices, um, you know, out, to keep them marginalized, to perpetuate, um, again, the kind of situation that Nicolette was talking about, where, you know, we examine, we put under the microscope, the condition of you know black women, and when I say that I, all the time, of course, I mean in all our different um, you know guises and identities. But to put all of that under the microscope without actually talking to us, without actually giving us you know the opportunities, um, you know, in fact, actively working against us having those opportunities to shape our own destinies. And if the Generation Equality Forum is to deliver on its aspirations. That needs to be part of the sea change that comes out of that comes out of it. Thank you, Chidi. Mariama, over to you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je pense que uh, beaucoup de propositions ont été faites uh, dans le bon sens du, du partage, mais moi, ce que je pourrais augmenter, c'est vraiment uh, à ce qu'on travaille pour mieux avoir une bonne lecture des uh, réclamations de ces femmes rurales. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, il faut vraiment être à côté pour mieux comprendre ce qu'elles ressentent et ce qu'elles veulent exprimer. Et je pense qu'aujourd'hui, avec uh, la, la création uh, de ce mouvement, est, est une idée noble qui pourra quand même permettre à, à, à ces leaders qui sont au niveau de ces mouvements, au niveau de la base, de mieux s'exprimer, de mieux faire comprendre ce qu'elles pensent, ce qu'elles sont en train de faire. Le soutien, c'est vraiment avoir une bonne lecture. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, ce qu'on est en train euh, de déplorer, c'est peut-être une incompréhension de la prise en compte du, du, de des enjeux sur ce que nous, on est en train de, 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 de pleurnicher. Ce n'est pas le fait de perdre euh, le rôle, mais euh, en tant que mère et mère nourricière africaine, nous avons nos valeurs, nous avons nos identités que nous devons préserver. Et nous pensons qu'avec ces forums pareils, avec ces organisations pareilles, avec la réalisation de ces échanges et de ces partages, ça pourra amener vraiment ce qu'on est en train de pleurnicher et nous pouvons apprendre le combat ensemble et trouver des solutions à, à résoudre auprès de ces braves femmes qui sont vraiment engagées et qui ne sont jamais 
découragés et qui ne sont jamais déçus malgré les aléas et les politiques qui font une pression sur elles, mais elles sont toujours là et au devant en train de, de se plaindre parce qu'elles n'ont que ça. Elles se reconnaissent dans ça et elles pensent qu'avec des leaders comme vous, nous pouvons aller de loin et nous pouvons trouver ensemble des solutions pour aller vraiment à des solutions euh, souveraines, vraiment qui peuvent amener notre Afrique, qui peuvent rehausser la place de la femme, qui peuvent faire connaître vraiment le rôle que la femme africaine joue par rapport au développement de son continent, de son pays et même au niveau mondial. Donc, euh, vraiment, je vous remercie de tout cœur d'avoir réalisé euh, ce panel et d'avoir échangé et d'inviter vraiment ces braves femmes que j'ai entendues s'exprimer. Vraiment, je pense qu'il euh, y a du fruit dans ce que vous êtes en train de faire. Je vous remercie de tout cœur. Thank you. Thank you all to our wonderful speakers for your brilliance, your power. Um, I think you've all just really filled my, me and I'm sure our audience um, and really set the tone for this Generation Equality Forum. Here we are, we're ready and we have a lot to say and our brilliance and power showed today. We want to particularly thank Pumzile who's retiring this year um, it continues to be a pleasure working with you, Pumzile, as UN Women ED, and we celebrate and acknowledge you. Um, we also hope that the Secretary General and your successor continue to champion the rights of Black women and non-binary people. We want to thank also all of our interpreters, Jess of the Transnational Institute and Naima of the Black Feminist Fund, who have supported the production of the webinar, and our communications team, Two Heads 221 in Dakar. You might be behind the scenes, but we know none of this would be possible without you. Thank you so much. Um, 60 Minutes can't do justice to the past and the present and the future of global Black feminisms, but we hope that we've set a tone, as I said, for the Generation Equality Forum and given you, our audience, some food for thought. Over the next few months, we'll also be inviting our guests here today and other Black feminists to join us in more in-depth conversations about some of the topics that you've heard today. So please do follow us on social media at Black Fem Fund on Twitter and at Black Feminist Fund on Instagram and LinkedIn. Contact us also on our website at blackfeministfund.org and donate if you can. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Still love it.